Hello, I'm Rochelle Carey in for Femioke, and you're on the stream. Accusations of racism at England's Yorkshire County Cricket Club are sparking a wider conversation about how minorities are treated in the sport. Today we ask, is English cricket racist? And if you're watching us on YouTube, please join the discussion. Leave your thoughts in our live comment section and you too will be in the stream. A recent investigation found that former Yorkshire County Cricket Club member Azeem Rafiq was routinely subjected to racial abuse and harassment. Rafiq says he often felt like an outsider and that the abuse got so bad he contemplated taking his own life. Here's what he told Sky News in September 2020. The thing that hurts me more than anything else is people saw it happen. Privately, a lot of people said it's wrong. But when it came to it, no one, not one person, actually stood up against these powerful people and said, what you're doing is wrong. So the Yorkshire case is exposed and many say is an ugly truth. That despite a diverse fan base, English cricket is too white and does not reflect a changing United Kingdom. Joining us from the UK to discuss this, we have Alex Tudor. He's a former England cricketer and current coach at Kim Bolton. Also, London-based sports correspondent and author Lee Wellings. And lastly, Saj Sadiq. He's an editor with the Passion.net. Welcome to everyone. So this discussion is not Hi. an abstract discussion. As you could see there, this is a very personal discussion for a lot of people and really painful. So having said that, I want to go to you first, Alex. What is your reaction to seeing... Um, how much pain he was in describing what he'd been through. Yeah, um, so disappointed. I, I, I'm so proud that he, he stood up. As you said, you know, he would have felt um, alone, under pressure a little bit. People would have said stuff to him, don't do it, don't go against them. And luckily, he had enough in himself to say, no, enough is enough. And he stood up. And, 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 and thank God he got backed by a writer called George Bell who picked up the story and, and, and ran with it. And it gave it some, um, some credence uh, because, you know, he had a following and a backing and it hit international news. Um, people started to listen. And then, it, as we know, you know, the story quickly came forward. But he went for a torrid time. You know, he, he came forward years before and and it fell on deaf ears and it you know people had told him to you know just sort of suck it up get on with it and that's just wrong and and, and we are where we are today and and as i said we are where we are today because you know sponsors started to pull away from yorkshire and they started to get hit in the pocket and that's when they started to take this really really seriously and it, but it should never have got to that saj can you tell me what the journey must have been like for him to finally say something publicly because as a as a person of color I, I know you know we absorb a lot of things macroaggressions microaggressions that we just kind of roll with the punches but how bad do you think it must have been for him to to go public it must have been very very difficult for him because at first he probably thought am I doing the right thing? And then there will be all the issues regarding retribution, his future, would people believe him? All, all the, I, I know myself and all those things were actually going through his mind. And, you know, there were self-doubts as well. At, at some point he did think, was he doing the right thing? But I think um, his faith helped him, the support that he got from members of the public, other Asian cricketers, and as Alex said, um, members of the, the media as well. That was absolutely crucial. But I think, you know, there's no surprise in what Azim is Azim's allegations were. I think a lot of people uh, are actually surprised with what has come out, but this has been going on for decades in English cricket. This mm. isn't something new. This isn't to be surprised about. It's, it, it's been going on for a very long time. It's been brushed under the carpet. Nothing has been done about it. People have said that we will, people have said uh, at clubs that, uh, yeah, we'll look into it. We'll, we'll take this forward. But nothing was done. As I say, it was brushed under the carpet for decades. And I think um, those in the corridors of power in English cricket probably thought that this would be another case where it would be brushed under the carpet. Lee, do you, do you think that people 
are genuinely surprised or are they willfully ignorant? I don't think anybody should be surprised by what we've seen here. I think what's really tragic about it is the battle, as Alex was saying, that Azim Rafiq has faced actually bringing this to the public eye. Imagine all of those years where he said he dreaded going to work every single day. He contemplated suicide. He's a young man and his career, well, where is his career? His cricketing career is in tatters. He's got so much talent. I mean, this was someone who was uh, a captain of England youth. And the point that we'll get into here is that this is Yorkshire now very explicitly in the spotlight and clearly there's been wrongdoing and clearly the way they've handled this has been appalling. And that's Yorkshire. And there will be a massive fo focus on Yorkshire. And people will try to get to the bottom of what happened historically, what they do now, and of course, crucially, what they do in the future. Okay, but it's so... not just Yorkshire. It's so much more than that. It's other mm. uh, cricket counties. It's other people in sport. It's other people in society. And that's what we're getting. Yorkshire have reflected that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And we are going to definitely broaden it out beyond Yorkshire, but we're not letting Yorkshire off the hook just yet. Before we do that, I actually <laughs> want to play um, a little bit of what their, their newly installed leader had to say. Let's listen to that. I thank Azim Rafiq for his bravery in speaking out. Azim is a whistleblower and should be praised as such. And he should have never have been put through this. And I'd like to apologise to him. We're sorry for what you and your family experienced and the way in which we've handled this. What happened to you must never happen again to anyone. While some strides have been made in the area of racism across the world of sports, this episode highlights a huge amount of work that still needs to be done. There's a clear need for a urgent and seismic change, starting from within. And I'm determined to lead this club to a better and more positive future. Okay, that all sounds and looks great, right? But, but the YCC also said that some of what um, Azim Rafiq experienced was, while some of it was harassment and bullying, they actually said some of it was just friendly banter between players and that there really weren't going to be any consequences for anybody. Um, someone who actually follows us on Twitter, I think, put this very well. Friendly banter is only friendly banter if everyone agrees it is. And it's very clear yeah. that Rafiq did not um, think that there was anything funny or friendly about this. Alex, your reaction to how the club is, has handled this? Listen, as, as, as Lee said, it's been... I, I don't know where Yorkshire have been for the last two years, 18 months, especially after the George Floyd incident. People just had enough. And for them to have their internal investigation and then decide, you know, at the end of it, that it's just friendly banter was just unacceptable. What are you telling the next generation of Asian kids in Yorkshire that are trying to get through the age group teams and into the uh, into their, say, to play professionally. You know, that it's open season, that if anyone says anything, it's just going to be banter. You know, my worry is, is that, you know, the people at the top, you know, these are high-powered people. These are people who have big businesses and stuff like that. For them to have this internal investigation and then to come up with this solution that, it's just going to be banter. We're going to brush it under the carpet. No one's really going to challenge us. And then for it to come out was just for me, was just brain dead for me. And, 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 they're, and they're paying for it now. And they're paying for it in the pocket where they're getting hurt because sponsors are pulled out. And it only got serious once sponsors started to take away their money. And that's how you hurt people in, in this day and age. Saj, um, Alex referenced, you know, what kind of message does this send to kids? And um, cricket is an extremely popular sport um, for, for people with South Asian backgrounds. 30% of recreational cricket players across England and Wales have South Asian backgrounds. Only 4% of professional cricketers are British Asian. Why is that? What is the disconnect? 
Well, there's a few issues there. I mean, first and foremost, it's uh, good to see uh, Lord Patel there um, speaking very openly and honestly, and a person of a cricket club as well. Uh, I think that's a, a, a wide ranging issue. There's a, there's a lack of coaches of ethnic minorities within English cricket. There's a lack of uh, people from ethnic minorities within the boardrooms uh, running these clubs and in positions of power. Well, I mean, that's something that uh, needs looking at as well. Asian cricketers, Afro-Caribbean cricketers in, in, um, in England are disillusioned with cricket. They, they see themselves as talented cricketers. They see themselves as good enough they are sometimes better than their peers. Sometimes they're on a level with their peers. But what they're getting isn't a fair crack. So they'll be going to matches. They'll be playing academy level. They'll be playing at um, below second 11 level, sometimes even at second 11 level. And they'll be performing. But when it comes to actual selection, when it comes to renewal of contracts, too often those lads are the ones who are chased out of the club who get their letter which says sorry we don't need you anymore so that then spreads look at Bradford look at Birmingham look at London Manchester these areas you'll see parks absolutely full of Asian cricketers lads who are very very good cricketers but why don't they make that to the highest level of cricket as I say because of a lack of belief not only in themselves so, uh, we like uh, we like okay in the OK, so let, let me let me bring that to you, though, because I think this is a problem that is um, prevalent in a lot of sports in the NFL, the National Football League in the U.S. The first thing you'll hear about when there isn't a black head coach is, well, there weren't enough assistants. We didn't have the pipeline. Well, you could fix that if you want to fix the pipeline. Clearly, there is a talent pool for um, for a cricket not to be as white as it is. This is a choice people are making. Lee. Yeah, what worries me is that people in sport, running sport, know they need to fix things now because their backs are against the wall. So there is some good that will come out of this because some things will be fixed. I mean, it's extraordinary that the murder of a black man in America and the protests, a lot of the protests happened around sport. Only that could lead to any action. And, and as Alex said, then Yorkshire weren't even taking any notice of that at all. And th their case is actually that they're in isolation. But what worries me is around Yorkshire, so the English cricket board, you know, are, they've had a diverse, a diverse team on the field in a World Cup semi-final against New Zealand. They're bringing through a new game that's more inclusive in terms of gender and families as well as race, uh, called the 100. So some of the stuff they're doing is working. But what about that past decade? And are some of the administrators still in power? And what were they doing at the time? What gets me? So Al Jazeera made a program about the lack of black football coaches globally that I was heavily involved with. We made that in 2015. Who else? I mean, Al Jazeera has a lot of diversity in its uh, newsrooms and, and its production. Who else was making programs then? So you've still got the same administrators, the same people in the boardroom making these decisions. And a lot of them, mm. this is the key word for me, cosmetic there's a lot of cosmetic changes. Is the culture changing? You're, you're, what you're describing is institutional. I mean, the, what you're saying is yeah. that this is something yeah. that it's, its very foundation needs to change. It's not just shifting people um, here and there, or people that look the way you want them to look for what your cause is. Right, Alex? Yeah, I, I, I just I feel, and, and Lee makes a great point. I, I've always said, unless people always say they want to, have change and make change and they put lip service out. People are sick and tired of it now. They've had enough. But when you look at the top, and I'm talking about the boardroom level now, and you walk in, it is predominantly white, middle-aged or older men that are in charge. And we are not privy to what happens in those meetings. But you can, you can sort of have a guess of the conversations that are going on in there. And sort of just going back to your point about, you know, especially with the Asian guys, you know, playing cricket. Listen, where I, where I, I grew up in Ellsfield, OK, in Wandsworth in South London, and the cricket club that I was um, affiliated with, honestly, about 80 percent Asian guys. And they play uh, representative age group stuff. But as Sad says, you do not see that transferred when it comes to contracts. 
You just do not see it. You will see them being used, playing in second team games, and they're doing well, just as good as their, their white counterparts. But when it comes to that contract, they're not getting it. And for me, that's unfair. And, you know, as, as, a, as, a, as a black man playing, you know, the majority of black kids would have had that conversation with their dad or their parents that you have to be twice as good if you're going Alex, to get that opportunity. How many black cricketers have played for England since you played for them 20 years ago? How many black cricketers for well, England? And is well, I that can name them. <laughs> you know, it, I can name them. You know, it's what, four or five? Mm. You know, Chris Jordan, Joffre Archer, Tymon Mills. I mean, That's there's it. not many at all. You know, there's only, I think, seven or eight playing in first class cricket. At the moment, when I when I played in the 90s, every county had at least three or four. So as a young black man, I'm looking and thinking, OK, it's not a close shot. There is an opportunity. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm going to give it a go. If you look now, and I work in the school, if you look now and obviously, you know, you have to have, you know, Sky or, 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 or whatever to watch international cricket, the kids are not seeing it. You know, the kids that you're trying to entice to this great game and not seeing it. And that's part of the problem for me. I know it's money-based and these, and these companies put in a, a lot of money. Okay. You know, and I'm lucky Let enough me... to, to, to work for one, but, you know, I wanna... it, for me, yeah. sorry, go on. No, it's okay, Alex, I want to interrupt because I, just, I do want to, um, I do want to acknowledge so many people that are watching us on YouTube. And hmm. Leo sent in a comment that said, the UK elite is oblivious to the legacy of privilege, classism, and colonialism. <laughs> that they have left in their wake. Cricket is just a small part of that. Um, Saj, I want to pivot to you on this. Um, I know that you say that you have experienced racism both um, playing cricket and now on the other side reporting it. Can you share some of that with our audience? That's right, yes. I mean, uh, I've been covering cricket since 2009 and um, you go to some press boxes and you get some very strange looks because it is made up of largely uh, white middle class individuals and I mean some of the faces are familiar now to me so they recognize me but uh, you do get the occasion where sometimes people look at you and think hang on what's, what's he doing in here mm. I mean my my own experience of uh, racism um, you know th this year was particularly bad I was covering the England Pakistan series and I went to four different venues um, as a journalist of colour, and there were incidents at every single one of those venues. I'll, I'll give you an example. One of the uh, the venues, um, as a, an accredited journalist, you get um, a uh, parking permit if you require one. Um, so I went towards the uh, the car park at uh, near, near one of the venues, and the the car park attendant there said, um, "Sorry, mate, this is only for press." without even speaking to me, without even sort of asking me who I was or where I was from. I had a press pass around my neck and um, he said to me, well, no, sorry, mate, you're, you're not allowed in here. It's, it's for press only. When I showed him my press pass that I was accredited pass, I, uh, accredited media, I showed him my uh, press pass as well and the, um, the email on my phone to say that I was accredited. And he said, well, I could buy one of those press passes from uh, anywhere. You know, that, that looks fake to me. So it was constantly having to prove yourself over and over Absolutely. and over. Absolutely. Even to get into some of the press boxes, they are doubting if you are authentic media. They're checking your press passes again and again. Even whilst you're sat in the press box, you, as I say, you're getting those strange looks. Um, th this summer, we had, um, obviously, the, the COVID protocols. You had to have... Um, you know, COVID uh, regulations on your phone to make sure that you had an, a negative test, even showing those to some of the, the security personnel, they wouldn't believe you. Yet those same, uh, if that same information that people were showing on their phones who weren't of an ethnic background, uh, they were mm. saying, come through, sir, come through, madam. I mean, I could give you countless examples. These are just a couple. You know, I yeah. think you have to actually be part <laughs> of it to, to realise how bad yeah. it is. Well, hold, hold. Oh, go ahead, go ahead real quick, Alex, go ahead. No, no, I was going to say, I could tell you a quick story. I, I was playing an England on the 19 game um, in Taunton some years ago, and I spoke about it. We did a documentary on Sky about it because um, they wanted to know where all the sort of Black Caribbean, British Black Caribbean players are. And I had turned up in the morning of this game, walked into the change room, and the coach, not going to mention his name, but the coach at the time, um, had said, oh, 
do you have my car stereo? And I, I had no idea what he was talking about. I'll get, he said, well, my car's been broken into. It must be you. And I'm wow. like, well, are, wow. you, are you saying it's only because I'm the only black guy in this team? And then as I was 17 at the time. And I got very upset because my dad raised me right. And I challenged him. But I had a fear of, if I unleash on this guy, mm-hmm. I'm going to jeopardize yeah. my chances of playing for England, which I've always wanted to do. So as I've got older and I've got more educated on the subjects, it was like, you know what? I, you know, he was digging a bigger hole because then it was, you know, take that chip off your shoulder as I was getting right. angry. Because then, yeah, then, got- it, then it's your fault. If you become and then angry. it's my fault because I'm getting angry and then we're showing so, those scenes are all very aggressive. And so, so me, I try to come different. Let me bring in something that you all have, have mentioned. All three of you have referenced that the way to change this, because obviously this racism is a reflection of what's happening in society at large. But the way you change this sometimes is money and sponsors. And that's how this works. I want to play something from a cricket fan who sent us in a video. Samar Habib. This is what he said. Of this news that's been coming out over the last week has been a surprise to us. The only surprise has been that it's now being taken seriously um, and that sponsors have understood their responsibility and have started uh, withdrawing their support of the club. Hopefully it will be a huge catalyst for change, uh, not just at Yorkshire Cricket Club, but for cricket clubs around the country. Leo, I I want you to, to, to speak to that, please. Yeah. So why is this happening now? Why is this Azim Rafiq case happening and unfolding every day? And so we need to be careful that as each new uh, allegation or, or proven fact comes up about Yorkshire, that we don't just leave the story there. We keep doing this and expanding it because his case hidden away. What other cases mm. are hidden away? And what's anybody doing about it? Now, I, I do want to bring in another sport football uh, that we, we've yes. talked about in the past in this program. Absolutely. Because I took a very hard line on racism in football, I mean, in, in, in all sports. But I feel, and I've said publicly for a long time, and I've spoken to people at both organisations, that FIFA and UEFA, and then all of the organisa- organisations under them, should get a legal framework in place that when there are repeated racist acts, repeat offenders, or even if we could get to a situation where it's one, one proven uh, incident, that teams, nations, players start to be expelled. Because I tell you what, fines and suspensions are not enough. They're nowhere near enough. And what happens is there are token gestures. So there are token mm-hmm. gestures in this. There are token gestures mm-hmm. throughout sport. And what's happening as well, and I'm, I, I'm being educated on this as well, back covering. And the back covering that's happening and virtue signaling from some of the people that should be tougher in the first place. And the time to get tough is when there aren't instances like Azim Rafiq. Get tough because you know this kind of thing is going on in the first place. Well, let me, Create a culture where it doesn't happen. So let me put this, we're almost out of time, but it isn't the bottom line, yes, it's sponsors, et cetera, et cetera, but racism and things like this end when white culture decides that it ends. It has to be, mm-hmm. it, it, they're, they're the ones that, that run the ship and can say that this mm-hmm. is enough. I mean, some of the people that are saying they're surprised are the same people who their friends are actually saying these things. So it, that isn't that how a culture actually changes? Uh, Lee, you can have the last word on this. Yeah, well, it has to change and it is changing. And we need to be honest that there has been pretty close to seismic change since the George Floyd situation. I write about it a lot in the the book that I'm writing about at the moment, that I'm worried about some of the cosmetic changes are happening and some of the back covering. But I'm educated that um, the change that is happening has to, and that you can't be what you can't see. So each time there is a, what I feel might be a cosmetic change, it's actually making a difference. And this case, and the terrible thing that Azim Rafiq has gone through, the one thing we can get out of it is that Quickly. maybe others won't have to go through it. Ah, that is a perfect way to end it. Mr. Lee Wellings, thank you very much. And we also had a viewer who said, I did know there was a racist side to cricket. Well, now you do. Unfortunately, that is all the time we have. A big thank you to all of our guests in our community for chiming in on our discussion. Until next time, thanks for your time.